Story number two. 1001 Bedtime Stories of World War II, based on The Last Flight of the Daisy May. Welcome back. This is Wayne Perkins, author and narrator of 1001 Bedtime Stories of World War II, based on The Last Flight of the Daisy May. In story number one, Heroism and Hope, we learn that 17-year-old Fran Perkins was talking with his older brothers Jim and Bob and his father Francis, or Frank Perkins, when, um, after turning on some music on their big console radio, the programming was interrupted by the news at Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, Wake Island, Midway, and just about everywhere else in the world, were all attacked by the Empire of Japan. Here's where we left off. Looking at his young boys today, Fran knows they will learn war from first-hand experience rather than from books. He is too dumbfounded to speak, the memories vivid in his consciousness even after 20 years. The oldest brother, Jim, in his early 20s, takes over the conversation. Dad, it's our time to be adults and take care of you. You did a great job raising us. You did it with one hand tied behind your back because of Mom's stroke after giving birth to Ray. Now we must fight for our country and our family. I appreciate everything you've done for us, Dad. Tomorrow I am joining the Army. Bob, are you coming with me? Yes, I want to join the Army Air Corps and bomb those bastards straight to hell. What about me? Young Fran asks. I'm going too. You're still in high school. I want you to finish in June before going anywhere, Frank demands. You won't be able to get a good job at the city anymore without a high school diploma. Not to worry, Dad, Bob pipes up. By the time Fran enters basic training, Jim and I will finish the war. They'll send Frank right back home so he can marry Elaine. Fran defends. There'll be plenty of war left by the time I get in. The Germans are next after you take care of the Japanese. I'll be in one of those fast little fighter planes knocking down everything in the sky. What Fran does not realize is that in four days on December 11, 1941, Germany declares war on the United States, mostly because they want Japan to help them defeat the Russian. Hitler feels Japan is not strong enough to take on the United States, but they will definitely be able to take the pressure off the European front with Japanese invading Russia from the West. The only question is, how strong is the United States of America? Fran asks, what's war like, Dad? Dad says nothing, but quickly and quietly walks out of the room. Jim explains, Dad never talks about the war, Fran. World War I veterans never talk about the war. That's right, Bob adds. It was like living through a horrible nightmare every single day. Dad never complains, but I know he has nightmares still over 20 years after the war. Jim clarifies, now that nightmare is ours to share, all three of us need to enlist first thing tomorrow morning. We need to show those Japanese that the Perkins boys stick together. Blood is thicker than water, like Dad always says. The Birmingham Family Later on Sunday, Fran leaves the house in the Brainerd district of Chicago and heads over to Elaine's house at 9336 South Clifton Park Avenue in Evergreen Park. He politely knocks on the door, and Clarence Birmingham, Elaine's father, turns off the large console radio looking much like the one in the living room of the Perkins home. The radio was airing his favorite show, The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny, his favorite comedian. Welcome, Fran, Clarence smiles as he opens the door. May and Elaine are in the dining room setting the table. I hope you enjoy yourself this evening. Clarence Birmingham is a kind man who works for the transportation system in Chicago. He was born in 1888 in Silver Springs, Maryland, not far from Washington, D.C. Clarence dropped out of school in the fourth grade to assist his brothers working in the family bakery business. As a young boy, Clarence drove a horse-drawn wagon delivering bread, pies, cakes, and other baked goods in Washington, D.C. He delivered bread to the White House and occasionally handed the fresh bread directly to President William McKinley. McKinley was a war hero in the Civil War and won the Spanish-American War while president. As a young boy, Clarence was easygoing and not awestruck 
by the presidents and congressmen he served. Clarence Birmingham, like Fran Perkins, served in World War I. He had a strong, steady focus that made him invaluable in the trenches of war. He does not talk about it. May greets Fran as he walks through the enclosed porch to the dining room. She smiles, takes Fran by the hand, and sits him at the head of the table. May grew up in a large dairy farm in Wisconsin. Her father makes the best churned butter in all of Wisconsin. In fact, he won a blue ribbon at the Columbian World Exposition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair, in 1893. May is very sociable. She loves to have visitors. She has a way of making a dear friend of every stranger. Today, her natural talent of helping strangers feel comfortable affects young Fran Perkins. Fran, I know you're upset by the radio broadcast. How do you feel right now? I don't know what to think. Tomorrow I'm skipping school and joining the Army with my brothers, Bob and Jim. Bob and I are enlisting in the Army Air Corps and Jim in the Army. We want to fight this war so my little brothers, Eddie and Ray, won't have to fight. Elaine enters the room, looking radiant in a suitable Sunday dress. She is finally in a public school, Calumet High School, after spending grade school in a Catholic grade school called Longwood Academy in nearby Washington Heights. Elaine carries a notebook. She writes for the school newspaper and the school yearbook called Temulac, which is Calumet spelled backwards. Conversation leads to Fran asking questions about the home, the Christmas tree, and decorations while Elaine is taking notes. Hey, Elaine, what are you writing? Fran queries. I know this is an important day in history. A world war starts this day for America. I want to record everything now so I can write articles for the school paper or even write a book someday about World War II. Fifty years from now, no one will remember how people felt on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. I want to help them remember today and all the events of this day. Fran looks around the room, and it is growing darker outside, and now the dining room is taking on a different tone. Fran relaxes and feels safe and warm in the Birmingham household. Fran silently hopes he will marry Elaine someday, and he can spend more evenings in the candlelit dining room belonging to Clarence and May Birmingham. May and Clarence are in a mixed marriage. May is a devout Catholic, and Clarence never attends church of any kind. May is a poster child for the way a true Catholic should live her life. Faith, hope, and charity are inborn behaviors. May never has a bad word to say about anyone. She respects people of all faiths, colors, and creeds. Clarence, on the other hand, never talks about religion nor goes to church. However, he lives his life the same way May does. Even though he has no one or no religion to account to, he lives a life of charity and goodwill toward others. He and May go through life seeing the best in everyone they meet. Silently, he gives to the poor without allowing the beneficiary the opportunity to lose any dignity. There were no income tax breaks for charity back in those days. He gives from his heart and soul, not because of any fundraiser or outside request. Clarence is a deeply spiritual man, yet never talks about what he believes, even to May. Clarence quietly and privately helps others. Clarence and I are going down to the Ford plant this week to see if we can help out. Ford is manufacturing engines for bombers for allied countries, England, Canada, Australia, and India. The Ford plant in Chicago makes the engines, and the new Willow Run factory in Detroit is making the largest bombers in the world. I imagine some of those bombers will bomb Japan as well as Germany to win the war. Fran is impressed. He makes a mistake, though, when he turns to Clarence and asks, Sir, what was it like to be in battle? Clarence says nothing. His eyes look downward as he quickly and quietly leaves the room. Thank you once again for listening to A Thousand and One Bedtime Stories of World War II based on my book, The Last Flight of the Daisy May by Wayne Perkins. You can find it in bookstores and, of course, on Amazon.com, both in print form and in Kindle. Like and subscribe. 
I'll look forward to seeing you again in the next episode, which will be story number three coming up shortly.